Are we going to reveal at any any point that you were named after James Herbert Jane? <laughs> In Britain, an ancient kingdom with legends of violence, cruelty, and torment in its blood. Join your hosts, Ross, John, and James, as they bravely tread where few would dare. Witness their journey into the horrific history of British horror. They are... The General Witchfinders. Ladies and gentlemen, goblins and ghouls, welcome to the fourth episode of the General Witchfinders podcast. I'm James in Bournemouth on the south coast of England. I'm John Pountney. I'm in south of Wales, in South Wales. Oh, I did it again. Uh, I'm Ross in Dorchester in southern England. And today's episode, we're going to cover James Herbert's The Rats. They have been here since the dawn of time. They were on the battlefield with Alexander the Great. They were on the edge of Moscow with Napoleon. They're on every continent, in every city, and we do little to stop them. They're here now, waiting, watching. They've gone unchecked, unnoticed, and now they're monsters. What's the matter? My hand, something bit my hand. Are you okay? Let's get the hell out of here. But the fight itself is, is much larger than anything I'm familiar with. No, if I had to guess, I'd say something in the order of a Great Dane. Except the dogs don't have the jaw pressure to stab through those metacarpals that cleanly. Would you believe the other day I saw a rat this big? Are you through? No, I mean it. He was this big. Perhaps you could just go and check out the drain for me, please? <laughs> It's hard to believe that rats, even sewer rats, would attack a grown man. As far as I'm concerned, they're just stories. Overpopulated. Ah! Oversized. And hungry. Ah! Not just for food, but for... Paul, your lady friend was absolutely right about the rats. They've gotten into the subway. The rat population of the world is estimated to be 108 billion, 24 times the human population. And this comes with a General Witchfinder's trigger warning. This book has some very outdated attitudes, language, and cultural depiction, which may cause offence today. So, uh, the plot. Harris, a young East London art teacher, notices that one of his students has a bloody bandage around his hand. Meanwhile, a baby girl and her dog are killed by mischief of giant rats. Harris takes the student to the hospital and sees the grieving mother with her dead child. According to the doctor, the number of seemingly unprovoked rat attacks have increased. The rats become increasingly more vicious and daring as more and more public places are attacked, including a tube station and Harris's own school. Where did these mutant rats come from? And how can they be stopped? James Herbert became inspired to write The Rats, his first novel, in early 1972 whilst watching Todd Browning's Dracula, specifically after seeing the scenes where Renfield describes a nightmare he had involving hordes of rats. Published two years later, the first paperback edition sold out. After three weeks, it received harsh criticism upon publication, deemed to be far too graphic, and its betrayals of death and mutilation. James Herbert went on to write 23 books, including three sequels to The Rats, 
selling over 54 million copies worldwide. Yes. So here we go. What? Is a mischief a group of rats like a parliament of owls? Yeah, so I looked it up. Is it's... it really? Oh, good research, good yeah. research. Yeah, right. and a, a rat attack, that's that's how you describe when you knock on a door, isn't it? A rat attack, tat yeah. rat attack, tat yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. My initial idea was to start a, a James Herbert podcast. <laughs> good grief. <laughs> Mainly because I wanted to, for the name I came up with was Herbert Goes Bananas. Nice. <laughs> and that, that yeah. was after I recently read The Spear, James Herbert yes. um, right. book about Nazi artifacts. Are, are you talking about The Spear of Destiny? The Spear of Destiny, the, the, yeah. The, the, the spear that is said to have pierced the, the, the uh, side of Christ. The torso of Christ oh. yes. yeah. upon his crucifixion by the, by the Romans. Yeah, I read that over Christmas hours. and um, it was pretty mental. And I. <laughs> And, and nothing... ripped off from someone else's yeah, book, wasn't yeah. it? And I bet research found out, yeah, it got sued for plagiarism after, mm. o- over that. And I, so I think I mooted that to you guys, and I, but I don't think either of you had in any um, interest in reading that no. many James Herbert Absolutely books. Absolutely chuffing not. No. However, when John came up with the idea for a horror podcast, I thought I'd better shoehorn in at least one James Herbert book. <laughs> um, and I think it's we both, we all of us, I think all three of us have got a, uh, a joint sort of history with James Herbert. Well, when you put it like that, <laughs> <laughs> because I was going to say that for me, I became uh, I became aware of him at school via Ross. Because I was going to say, Ross, you need to explain how because you were reading the Magic Cottage, yes. which is set in oh. nearby to us. Oh, I didn't realize uh, the New Forest. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. New Forest. Oh, right. right. And then after that, I was intrigued by that because at that age, thirteen and fourteen, you hadn't yet like acquired the critical faculties that you're going to get as you're older like you don't go like oh you know what's the theme what's the subtext here or what's the characterization like at that age i was just like is it a good story so for me there was no real kind of delineation between like the novelization of aliens um <laughs> and joseph heller's catch 22 it was just like oh, both good stories <laughs> yeah I've enjoyed them both. And so, like, when Ross said to me, oh, I've been reading Magic Cottage, it's really, really good. I said, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll give that a go. And I seem to remember I got, because, of course, I always ask for book tokens for, Christ- for Christmas. I still would, quite frankly. But, and I got the Jonah, mm-hmm. yeah. which is his one, like, the dark twin yeah. one, and Moon, of which I remember absolutely I can't remember anything nothing. about Moon. I, feel- I remember there's something on a dam. <laughs> the, 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 there's a scene on a dam mm. in the moonlight. Okay. Mm. I've I, read that book, the entire book, and that's literally all. I All I remember is that sentence. I from bet the we can book. all remember all the sex scenes, though, out of every single <laughs> one of those books. Weirdly enough, no. I can't. Uh, I can remember you, you that... telling me the one. Uh, oh, I'll oh, Ross will remember for me. Nah, I think. Yeah. The, wasn't there the one which Lenny Henry was going to make into a film about a uh, a journalist? What, the, called... Just the sexy ah, ah, <laughs> Yes, that is the one though, where he's a photographer. Yeah, and, and he sees stuff. And in he his, looks like um, Mitch, negatives. And, and, and I can't remember the sex scene. All I can remember is. Um, he, they all the characters comment that he looks like Mickey Rourke. <laughs> <laughs> And it's obviously James Herbert, as I think we'll find with the rats, that all of his heroes are James Herbert, aren't they? It me that all the, the um, heroes in his books got gradually older as James <laughs> Herbert himself became older. Right, what you know. Yeah, exactly. Or not, yeah. as we're going yeah. to see this evening in the case of <laughs> Because my dad had all of the James Herbert books um, when I was Is that growing how you up. got into them? Yeah, and he gave right. me Fluke to read, which is um, the one yeah. about the reincarnation of the dog, the, the guy waking up in the body of a dog. I think it's on the oh, cover. God. Is it a dog yeah, who yeah. thinks he's a man or a man who thinks he's a dog? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm intrigued. And then I realised, um, <laughs> reading The Magic Cottage, there were characters out of Fluke in, Mag- in The Magic Cottage. And it was like an early precursor to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But oh, really? all of these... Oh. There is a, a Herbert of a universe where there are um, <laughs> different characters. They all interact with each yeah. other. And also wow. people reincarnated for one book. Into, I think there, because there was a dog reincarnated as a squirrel in the Magic Cottage. Interesting. Well, I, never, yeah. I, I, I yeah. had no idea. The, the only one that I'm kind of pondering, rereading now, is The Fog, which I... I read The Rats first, and I've been trying to work out in my head, and this is... This is the story that I, I was stopped from telling last week by Ross because he said, save it, save it. Save it, yeah. So I, I think I definitely read The Rats before Italia 90. 
<laughs> because I was plagued with with waking nightmares of seeing the stadiums on the TV and seeing rats rush into the stadium Ooh. and attack the people and the players. Christ. And this 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 was a big psychological cloud over me in 1990. Well, I, I, was, I know we're going to rip this book apart in a moment, like a Qu- baby. Quite literally on camera. Yeah, like a baby. <laughs> in a frown. Being mauled by rats. However, yeah. books hardly ever affect me in any way. But yeah. reading this book... I woke up um, in, in, in uh, early hours of the morning, convinced there was a rat gnawing <laughs> really? at the wall in, the, in our loft. <laughs> this is such a classic Cleveland story. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, we, we'll comment more on this in yeah, a minute. Yeah. Carry yeah. on, Ross. This is classic And Cleaver. also, I went for a run the other day, and <laughs> a, black Down bird, by a, canal. a blackbird ran out in front of, hopped in front of me. <laughs> And my Been mind, my birds, my mind <laughs> saw that as a rat before it, <laughs> before it worked out that it was a blackbird. So, yeah. Even though we're going to come to it, it's incredibly badly written, and well, and uh, very much a book of its time. I think yes. it still does have some power over. It does. It does have some effect. I had to stop reading it the other night because I was finding it too depressing, really, to read before going to sleep. I had to stop reading and look at my phone for a bit because it is, it's unremittingly really grim and depressing. I don't know, he has a little little holiday in Stratford in the middle. Yeah, oh. that that part, oh my God. Before we do all that, before, before we do all that, we need to, um, Ross very, very kindly and out of the goodness of his own heart, basically paid for a, a copy of The Rats. That's the only way I can make you do it. Yeah, exactly. Right, it's the 40th anniversary edition, which they've, um, the design is... Kind of rat nord yeah, yeah, right around the outside. That's giving you. Yeah. Um, and then I noticed that you know you open up the cover and then there's a lot of very nice press for James Herbert, none yeah. of which relates to this book. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the sign. You're like, wait a minute, that's just praise for James Herbert, but not for this book. Not and for then this it book. opens up with an introduction yeah. by kind of Neil, Neil Gaiman, heavily who, heavily featured on the cover heavily for, yeah you know please people please buy this book but i did think often when you get introductions to things often you know i've spent a lot of my life looking at sort of like academic introductions to texts and things such as that and normally they're always done giving you a real sense of what you're, you're going to read here has a huge amount of significance what you're going to read here you know the, the, the writer is going to do this is, you know, he went on to do that and, and look out for this um in neil game one he pretty much just says this isn't very good <laughs> That's yeah. he says, and i'll read to you all the, the listening public first of all he says it was the first book he had written and the first book that he had tried to write <laughs> he composed it longhand. I thought, wait a minute, you know, that's a bit short. You know, that's and then uh he then says it's a first novel by someone who was not yet a novelist. <laughs> it's uh... easy to point to the weaknesses, an unmemorable <laughs> an, an unmemorable everyman hero, and the way that the stories within the story outshine the overall plot. And straight away I'm like, now come on, Neil, that's a bit generous. Yeah. yeah. But it was a first novel built by someone who from the start was a craftsman. And then he says he could always plot and his writing was never less than efficient. And I thought, oh, that is the most <laughs> damned by faint praise. Once again, yeah. as a teacher, that's the sort of thing of yeah. well, his work's been very efficient this term. Efficient. It's like, well, he's done it. And I had the impression yeah. that Neil Gaiman didn't write that prologue. He was talking to someone in a pub <laughs> yeah. and that person wrote it down what he said. Because it's, it's literally a page and a half. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this, it's a brief introduction. Yeah. This Neil guy, who I'm aware wrote two of the worst episodes of New Doctor Who of all time, <laughs> um, also has written an introduction to an author called Robert Aikman, who I thought I'd give a go because um, he's kind of listed as being a great ghost story and kind of weird story writer in the in the vein of M.R. James. I started, I tried to read Robert Aikman's work. And I found that awful. Oh. Uh, and it, what was that then, please? Oh, I, I said, oh, it's a shame because I, I quite enjoy his his book. His <laughs> oh, do stories. you really? Yeah, yeah. I thought they were awful, and I and so I think that that Neil, you don't know what you're talking about, mate. You've written a forward to two for two authors who are both terrible authors. So, I, are you trying to make yourself look good, or have you not got very good taste in in literature? And of course, remember, recently he got in trouble for kind of breaking the original COVID lockdown. After yes, splitting up with his did. wife, Amanda Palmer, he just bugging off back to Scotland, didn't he? Yeah, from New Zealand, wasn't yeah. it? 
Yeah. And he's like, so what? I'm in Scotland now. Sorry, everyone. Yeah. What a clown. <laughs> so, yeah. Don't... If if Neil Gaiman is like Paul Daniels, who found out <laughs> that mentioned now. him now. on a what, yes. episode of our podcast and then listened to it. Um, Neil, if you are listening to this, I do like some of your stuff. Uh, Neil, I I don't really even know who you are, but I do know that Nightmare in Silver was in my bottom five uh, <laughs> t- probably television series episodes of all time. And that's like, it's worse than an episode of Watchdog from like 1990 or something. <laughs> but no longer is even current. It has a nostalgia factor. Oh, man. Okay, okay. So that's the introduction. So even the man giving you the introduction says... Oh, is it? This is all that. <laughs> Brace yourself. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, we then get a load of kind of like vignettes, as we said oh. in the introduction, of basically just rats attacking people and killing people. And as you're reading it, I, I, it felt to me like uh, our friend Neil was saying that this was someone who was just trying to work out how to write a novel. And I think he thought, okay, I'm, I'll write some little short stories about um, uh, some people and then stick a rat attack in at, at the end. Yeah. So the, the first one, we come across a, a salesman who um, loses his job after his colleagues discover that he's gay and has been having sex with a younger male trainee. Yeah. Yes. Um, he discovers this whilst sitting on the toilet and reading <laughs> the writing about um, his illicit affair on the back of the toilet door. And then he cries, <laughs> cries for ages and sits on the toilet for quite a long time before having the courage to leave. Um, then he and then, becomes an alcoholic. Yeah. And then, he, yes. then a recurring theme in the book becomes an alcoholic tramp. Um, who, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which happens Plenty to quite a few people in this. Was, was London just festooned with alcoholic <laughs> tramps in the seventies? Um, the word that kept uh, flashing up in my mind, like the neon lettering at the start oh. of the arena program when it floats up in the bottle, oh, the bottle. was problematic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything about these vignettes is problematic. If you're writing a novel, the, the vignettes are good. In some ways, I think there's too many of them. Mm. But what what makes them really scattershot is the fact that he introduces characters for the point of then killing them. Yeah. So characters aren't introduced and then pop up later in the story in a way which kind of weaves the the, the narrative together. Characters are introduced. You get the whole bloody life story. And then it's like there was a scratching on the door. Um Michael felt his sphincter tighten and his heart yeah. pulse. Suddenly, beady eyes were looking at him through the keyhole. A rat jumped in, twisted off his genitals <laughs> with one gargantuan uh, now, leap. I'm pleased that John's gone for this straight away because, uh, like, I've highlighted this before we did the episode for them all, and I've got it ready for you go. I've got, I've got it in, in, indicated in my text, and I'm going to explain why. And I, yeah. I've wanted straight away from the start when we do general witch finders, I've not wanted to talk about my own life and my own embarrassing experiences too much. <laughs> but I feel if this circuit starts, I know, right? I'm going to read the, the, the bit out and then I'm going to tell you why it's so utterly ridiculous. Yeah, right? okay, go so, on. So everyone get comfy. Plump up, plump up your cushions. Yeah. The bearded man had risen to his feet, pulling a wriggling body from his face and tearing mostly hair from his cheek in the process. But... As he stood, one of the larger rats leapt at his groin, pulling away his genitals with one mighty twist of its body. The tramp screamed and fell to his knees, <laughs> thrusting his hands between his legs as if to stop the flow of blood. But he was immediately engulfed and toppled over by a wave of black, bristling bodies. Now, straight when I read this, I was like, what? Right. How big was that rat? Right. Because they say at all oh, they're big, they're big. But I'm still thinking. Even the with the size they are, it's no bigger than like say a Scots a Scottish terrier. Well, apparently, uh, um, in the film version, they um, dressed up dashing hounds. <laughs> I think at one point it's mentioned that they're two feet long. Yeah, apart yeah, from the big is... ones at the end. Ah, yeah, okay. which oh, yeah. Oh, that. So and here's so he, so here's my uh, here's here's my my tale for you. There was a period in which I was living in a house share. Uh, the details of which need need not bore us all now, but actually, actually, some of the details do need to bore us, right? It was owned by two people who had retired to the south of France. The house, yeah, and their daughter was kind of like the de facto land kind of landlord 
and sort of one of my housemates. So there were four of us living in this house. It was a very, very large house. And then in the summer, what would happen was the owner of the, the, owner of the house would return for yeah. a couple of weeks just to see the family and they would stay in the house. Now, oh. they, owned a, they owned a German shepherd that absolutely, I'm quite scared of dogs anyway, but this thing fucking scared the life out of me. Absolutely terrified me. The, the, the females of the family couldn't walk this dog because it was just so out of control. And just like, you know, and would like pull, it was so strong, they couldn't hold on to the lead. This is what we're talking about. And straight from the off, it just looked at me and was like, don't like you, mate. I don't like you. And whenever I would come into the house, it yeah. would run at me and leap up at me. Like, oh. Uh. And they're like, oh no, Jazz, get down, Jazz, Jazz, get down. Yeah, he doesn't like it. And it's me like, oh. right. So cut to one summer, the one summer that I was there. I'd just been down at the beach. I you know, live, live on the coast. I'd come back to the house and kind of gone, hello. No response anywhere. Went oh. up to the first floor. Cujo. Uh, the, the, the loud, yeah. And, and Cujo, Jazz, was right there. And straight away, I just thought, oh, fork. You know, the, 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 re- the normal family members that hold it off of me, stop attacking yeah. me, aren't there. And I thought, I don't quite know what to do here. So, and it's very much, this is a big German shepherd, a big, you know, I'm, I'm quite a tall, I'm, I'm a tall man, but this thing virtually came up to, up to my waist and it just walked across the lounge and I thought, don't run, don't run, don't run, <laughs> it'll attack you. And it came up and I was yeah. just wearing a pair of shorts, we've all been there, you know, just, just down there. <laughs> and it sniffed around me for a moment uh. and then basically it then bit my testicles. <laughs> <laughs> just the te- but this is what I'm saying. I went, whoa. <laughs> and then sort of let back, trying to hold it. See, already this is more terrifying than the rats, isn't it? Right? Hold my fear in place. And is that what you call your, your vital part? <laughs> yes. My fear. Right? I held my fear in place. The round of fear. The dog kind of held back, looked at me, and I backed out of the room and then pegged it upstairs and, and closed the door to my room. Now, I'm pleased to say... <laughs> The dog did not draw blood. And it's still in there, but, James. I can see. Absolutely. Right, but the, the point what I'm, I'm making here is if a German shepherd with mm. his mouth doesn't get my the, the entire, you know, the, the entire array down there, I'm sorry. Yeah. Even a genetically mutated rat isn't going to bite <laughs> off your entire cock and balls in one go. In one mighty twist. Yeah, one mighty... I was like, come on. What, even through his, tra- tra- his tramp trousers? I know. Well, Does it imply at that on. point that he's got his trousers down? Like it- <laughs> There was a scene later on where someone gets attacked and loses all of their clothes. Yeah, that <laughs> on the ridiculous. tube, a woman becomes... On the train. A fat, totally naked woman with with a with rats hanging off of each of her pendulous breasts <laughs> oh, <for laughs> what happened for the loser clothes okay oh, chapter two sorry, oh, thank you Th- thank you for for letting me get that that trauma off my chest everyone i have got to say that i found that chapter very problematic the first one i do f- yeah i find i just find as we go through the chapters that the people that that are talking about subtext, that the people that are kind of being punished in inverted commas are all people that have got, like, problems of some kind. Mm -hmm. So it's alcoholics, homosexuals, Catholics, women. It's basically, like, every, you know, not minority or whatever, but it's it's like... Anyone who isn't him. Yeah, basically, (laughs) anyone who isn't a white man up until about halfway through the book is just, like... Yeah. It's bizarre. It's really bizarre. We introduced to Harris. Did no. we ever hear what his first name is? No. Well, I thought that Harris was his first name. Oh, I thought it was Rolf. I thought this was the, the, <laughs> the Young Adventures of Rolf Harris. There's two reasons. We find out he's a, an art teacher. And also there's well, a point where he, he comments on some 14-year-old girl's breasts and says... The good bouncing jo- breasts. Yeah, bouncing breasts. And says that the job is worth it for the crumpets. Straight away, so, failed CRB yeah, check. Yeah, this is the Young Adventures of Rolf Harris. The problematic meter at that point went up to 100, 100. and actually the mercury burst out of it because it was so problematic. Is that what you call it, John? (laughs) I just read that and I thought, this is the goodie. (laughs) I like, what? And also, 
my big thing was, and I'll show the guys now. I've literally just written on, on the front page, chapter eleven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just, just get straight to chapter eleven because this is when we see Harris at work. And now there's two things to point out. Number one, that prior to 1989, we didn't have a national curriculum in Great Britain, so schools could teach pretty much whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. And as I was reading this, as I was reading through. I was like, what's, what's, what's he supposed to be? Do how old are these kids? <laughs> How, number one, how old are these kids? Mm. And then secondly, I was like, what's actually going on in this school? It's utterly ridiculous. And I now know that you know, schools are far more structured. But I was like, is this like a picture? So I'm torn between, is this actually a picture of what 1973 schooling was like in this country? Versus, is this written by someone who hadn't been into a school for over 30 years <laughs> when, it, when, he, when he started writing it? All right, you lot, shut up! He barked above the din. Scaly, sit down and blow your nose. Thomas, away from the window, back to your seat. Maureen, put your mirror away now. Right, all had a good weekend? That's enough. Let's call the register. <laughs> no one teaches like this, trust me, nobody teaches like this. They do if the you've... If you've seen Please Sir, that's like, that's oh, well, basically exactly. just the Please 19th Sir, 7th, isn't it? That's what yeah. it's like. The people sensed he was in a good mood and knew they could <laughs> get away with a little more cheek than normal. This morning, anyway. Only two absentees. Not bad for a Monday morning. Yes, Carlos, what is it? Toilet? We've only just got in. <laughs> Go on, then. You'll never concentrate if you don't. Carlos, a thin, dark-skinned boy, oh, God. thanked him sir and Problematic. left the room a smirk on his face when he when he had his back to the teacher he gets them all to basically draw he just gets them to do some drawing or an, an animal what draw an animal that? it's the sort of thing you give a five-year-old to do yeah. old, exactly because i was reading it, i was like how old are these kids right because then he says any good at drawing monkeys morris <laughs> no sir well try copying from a mirror harris told him knowing that the class expected and enjoyed his bringing down of a loud mouth, <laughs> even though any one of them could be next. Feeble, Harris thought. But not bad for a Monday morning. I thought that maybe this was his form, and then he had them for a bit, and then they went to other classes, because I think that's what I did in high school. You went in, you saw Mr. Kane, he took register, and then you had your first lesson after like 20 minutes or something. But why you're doing art first thing in the morning, I don't know. You'd never have art in the, at the start, would you? Let's draw an animal. At that moment, Carlos burst into the room in a state of extreme agitation. Sir, sir, in the playground, there's one of them things. He gesticulated towards the window, his eyes wide, smiling in excitement. And then he, we find out that he says, there, weren't, there wasn't one of them things, but several huge black rats. Uh, and I was like, nobody talks like this. One this of them just things, so, just so uh... Well, let's just pop back to... Uh, chapter uh, two. Chapter two. <laughs> <laughs> James is trying to improve the narrative by making it non-linear. As if um, Stephen Moffat had written it. <laughs> the, ca the main ca character dies at the end and flies off in a giant um, space uh, cafeteria. <laughs> exactly, yeah. No, the, the main character dies at the beginning and then is... <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Let's not talk about that. I thought this was quite disturbing for me when it, there was a baby who was killed by some rats. Yeah. So, so a, a little baby is killed by the rats when its mum goes next door Horrible to get some tea. The dog trying to protect the baby. But, however, yeah. I think quite effective. And also, nothing too problematic in there apart from a baby being killed. Well, it's, it's just gratuitous and it's pulp. It's like the lowest form of pulp fiction, isn't it? So you can't... Mm. To, to go from Neil... How do you say his name? Is it Gaiman or Gaiman? Gaiman. Say so, Potato, yeah. I'll say Neil himself because I think that's what he is on Twitter. To go from Neil himself's forward... Uh, when you think of him as being quite a renowned author, to then go into mm. this kind of sloppy, gratuitous... Um, it's just horrific. <laughs> and, not, and not horrific. He purposely went through this book trying to think of all the most shocking things he could possibly think oh, of. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, yeah, at that yeah. point, writing about a sympathetic gay character would have been shocking to, to people yeah. to read that. And that's, you know, in, the, in 73. 73. Yeah. Yeah. A baby yeah. being killed, uh, a mother yeah, yeah. Uh, 
pulling the dead baby's arm off and all that kind oh, of stuff God, was oh, pretty ridiculous, pretty horrific. But then in the story, there's a a boy called I think it's Keog, K E O G H, Keo, Keo, yeah. He's been bitten by one of the rats, and uh, Harris takes him to the hospital, and that's where they find out about the uh, the multiple rat attacks. Then we have a chapter about a character called Mary Kelly. Let's, hang on, let's not get, let's not quite get to Mary Kelly yet, because that's the, by far the most problematic neon light of the whole book. With Keo, it almost becomes interesting. Keo comes in. He's got the check shirt on. He's got jeans on. I think it mentions something about his shoes as well. And you think, right, we're in the 70s now. I can kind of see this in mind. He's been bitten. They go to the hospital. He's seen to by a nurse. And then you have this kind of coincidental uh, action of where the, the, the mother comes in with the dead baby from the attack. And you think, oh, he's lining up now. Things that have happened in the narrative. And that starts to make sense and mm. it, and you could you start to get this kind of feeling of impending doom but then he literally just throws all that up in the air and then writes a, like a a mini short story about this woman mary kelly who is most famously a victim of jack the ripper it's, jack it's the bizarre ripper. That he, yeah it's bizarre that he reuses that like name. all the names to pick yeah. and then he's got like this 10 15 page interlude it's where... one of the longest chapters oh it's awful yeah. and he basically tells this woman's life story which is weird which is basically a story of a woman who couldn't have an orgasm and yes uh, was having sex with as many people as she possibly could until she met someone who had a giant knob who could then give her <laughs> an orgasm which she was really yes. happy about they were going to get married and then he got run over by a tank when he went off to war <laughs> Before the war even started. Before the war started. So it's, you know, a bit of a clumsy idiot. Which then led her to become an alcoholic tramp. Mary Shelley's... Uh, Mary, Mary Shelley. Shelley. Mary Harris. No, fucking Mary hell. Mary Kelly. Mary Kelly. <laughs> so Mary Kelly is in... So she's an Irish Catholic. She's had this breakdown. She's become an alcoholic. You've had... It must be 15 pages. James, can you look quickly and see um, how many pages okay. it is? Whatever whatever chapter that is. So basically, you but, have uh, the all The first Hail Mary, right? Okay, so it's, it's in our edition, it's pages 24 to 41. Yeah. Oh, my God. It starts to build a bit of momentum. Hmm. It starts to make sense with the narrative and then it's just this part is just shoehorned in and it feels like filler it 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 just doesn't go anywhere then obviously um the rats attack all these people and and all these tramps and then they're all killed and then the last bit which is the bit that you think oh okay well the whole chapter really could have just been this is where the police turn up they all go in to find them they come out and they all vomit on the floor which i thought was a nice touch but um it did remind me a bit of um, the church setting of Dracula AD nineteen seventy two. Yes, mm-hmm. which is a bit nice kind of crossover there, the, isn't these, it? These for, two things for... could have been happening concurrently. They are, they could uh-huh. yeah yeah um, in the same universe the 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 Hammer Herbert universe crossover. super universe. Oh, that'd be amazing. Um, so I just I, I I despised that chapter. It sets up this woman. She has a tragic life. And then her reward for this tragic life is to be killed by giant rats. It's just, it's just not, it, it's quite lazy writing. I, I quite like the tramp getting his, uh, trying to get his tiny penis erect. That was quite funny. <laughs> I don't get enough of that in the books I read nowadays. <laughs> I thought that was the real kind of nadir of the, of the book, really. And there's many to choose from. Yeah. <laughs> Next introduced to Harris's girlfriend Jude, who he, yeah. he he makes get up in the morning to make him breakfast. Oh God, that! And then has a very weird, odd, sexy interlude with later on. They're talking to each other. She's in the bath, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, in the nip. No. He's not. And then she says, uh, "Judy murmured in soft appreciation as his hand reached the top of her legs." Oh, Jesus! What will you do till the school reopens? She asks. He pulled gently at a small mound of hair, almost preoccupied with his own thoughts. I might just have a look around the area, see how things are being cleaned up. Might even do a bit of painting. Otherwise, who does that? <laughs> well, so everyone's doing on furlough.
Well, who, who pulls on pubes? No one pulls on pubes. This is this is dated. This is one of the things that dated the book for me. Was the it's amount so, of pubes in this? In yeah, this. it's so. Um... It does show that James Herbert has a thing for pube pulling because it, I think there's at least three points in this book where someone has their pubes tugged upon. Which um, this is something which I think is a lost art now in the by, um... per, by person or persons unknown. This sex content in it is more horrific and more clumsily written than the horror, which is quite terrifying. <laughs> which is quite interesting as well because I I don't know if you guys watched the episode of Woke and I shared with you where James Herbert yeah. was on there. Right. I watched about half of it, but it, it, Herbert's a weird creepy voice and the other kind of jumped up guy who was so like Clive Barker who's so eager to outshine James Herbert that he looks like his neck is going to explode like the guy from Scanners like (laughs) his blood pressure is yeah yeah I'm here as well I've written loads of books I've had films I did Hellraiser it's like oh my god his eye it's like his eyes gonna pop out and Terry's just like family show folks (laughs) because they're just like Vestal Virgins Vestal Virgin oh he thought George Best being drunk on his show was the nadir <laughs> in the long run. But no. It doesn't just appeal to uh, people like us. It, it's kids as well, particularly kids. Yeah, kids love to be scared, mm. don't yeah, they? Yeah, and also oh, yeah. a lot of women readers. There's a, I guess uh, there were some figures I saw in America recently. About 60% of all horror f- novels are, uh, are bought by women. Yeah, but you're pushing it. You're pushing it beyond the bounds that most people would want to take it. But it's still safe, right? It's like, it's it's like going safe, on, a, yeah. on a ghost train ride. And, and in fact, they want us to do that for them. They want us to take it as far as we can go right. and drag them a little bit along the way. They can retreat, and we retreat as well, before we go the, to the ultimate. And I don't know well, yet what the ultimate well, is. Say, do, you, do you retreat? I don't think so. Uh, I think you go to the limits. I go to the, I've never censored myself. I've, the thing I've always said is, Everything I put in my books, I'll, I'll never say, no, Clive, you shouldn't say that. No, you forbid. I don't think you forbid yourself anything. No, I don't. I'm trying to be mild-mannered and family showish. <laughs> <laughs> never mind. Never mind. It's Halloween. Everybody wants to get frightened out of their wits tonight. But describe your stories. I mean, I know they're different, but do they have a central theme? I mean, your ultimate aim is to frighten the living daylight out of everybody. That, that's part of it. That's, uh, we, we, we entertain. We want to frighten people. We're like the, the roller coaster, the Big Dipper. We, we have our various themes, uh, and, and it's usually good against evil. Sometimes we twist it and have evil against evil. But uh, usually, I think with Clive's and, and certainly with mine, there is some kind of moral tone there. In that episode of Wogan, James Herbert says that children love reading his books. And I, I was yeah. thinking... If he knew kids would read his books, why was he putting so many... Why does he put all this fucking filth in? Because it it is filth. This is the kind of stuff, I think, reading this, that made Mary Whitehouse literally just uh, uh, head rotate. Because it is... It's just rubbish. It's just gratuitous, isn't it? Yeah, it's put in because it's just pulp. And I... I, You can't dress this book up as anything else, really. But however, I've got to say, as a 14-year-old boy, it was fucking amazing. It was it was it was everything I wanted to read in a book: I, sex, violence, and uh, the supernatural. Just all put into one. I remember strangely little about it actually, and I know that it that it did make a big mark on me. And I know that I tried to read others of his books, and I thought they were potentially all quite rubbish. Reading it now, it obviously didn't make much a mark on me because I the only bit I remembered really was the ending. I think, which is which is ludicrous. Just stop reading them around when poor tent when the earth um was rebelling against the human race what and uh, was, was sort of killing people and there's well, a that's, when that's, who's that's, doing that... hang on it, there was a glitch as you said the first part of the sentence and we i feel like i've just lost half an hour he, he wrote a book about called poor tent and it's all about oh right or um environmentalism and the earth yeah. starts rebelling against humans and killing them and there's, yes. a, there's a scene where a woman has sex with a tree in it. That's that, that M. Night Shyamalan film. That was, it was an absolute bomb. That was, which I can't remember the title the of. Event. Yeah. Also, the I event. Liked, I liked that film. Um, I stopped reading these when the Doctor Who New Adventures started. Um, cause... Speaking of which, if you uh, become a patron, there is an episode <laughs> where me and John talk about the first New Adventure book on there. For... I do, to, as an aside, I do think Mark Gatiss's Nightshade, uh, which is one of the very early New Adventures, does borrow very heavily from a James Herbert-inspired universe. 
I'm watching the Tom Baker uh, Doctor Who's from the beginning at the moment, and mm-hmm. the first one, Robot, which is a unit story. I was thinking this could be the, the unit could have dealt dealt with um this whole rat story. This feels like <laughs> late poetry er- crossover. Yeah. So this is a Hammer Doctor Who Herbert crossover. Exactly. Uh, but let's bring in now- Quatermass as well, I think, because Quatermass would have been he'd have loved oh, these yeah. giant rats. So we're introduced to a character called Foreskins, or Foskins, um, <laughs> who is for the Ministry of Health. And for some unknown reason, he's, Harris is now brought in. Absolutely. To oh. become because that part happens of the task all force. the time. This, all this, of the time. And this again is just so today, lazy, isn't it? It's like, there's a character, have either of you seen a film called Death Line? No, I don't think so. I'm aware of it. It's a 1972 horror film, which we probably should review because it's a real masterpiece that Christopher Mm. Lee comes in, I think, for one scene as a bowler-hatted MI5 agent. And he basically does what this guy Foskins does. And I think that because it's, it's about covering up the fact that there's cannibals living in the London underground. That's right, yeah, yeah. It's a brilliant film, but it's like... This is bollocks, James. Like, not you, James. James <laughs> Herbert. Right, like, this is it. just the laziest. You want to get an art teacher to come in and be a member <laughs> of your, I mean. your crack like, task force. That happens course. all the time, doesn't it? It's like you there, public servant teacher. Come and join the government yeah. task force. Yeah, but this is a couple because of you happen to live bits. in the area. Out of all the thousands of people that live in the East End, just because this guy has seen a rat, <laughs> he is now part of the like, task first force. First of all, it says... Hello. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, I, in my head, once again, it's the second time I've mentioned him on this podcast. I'm thinking Jacob Rees-Mogg. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, what, playing fo- Foreskins? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. always think it was Jeffrey Palmer. Hello, Mr. Harris, Foskins here. After his initial surprise, Harris answered, Hello, Foskins, uh, what can I... We wondered if, we, if you could help us in a small way, old chap. Well, of course, I... Just a few questions that some of our boys would like you to ask you. Nothing much, shouldn't take long. You see, it turns out that you're one of the very few people that have had actual contact with these killer rats and lived. If you'd come along this afternoon... Right? So it's like, like as if... It's like, please come and speak to the Ministry of Defence about how to kill a rat, art teacher. Well, I used a spade... Or, uh, you know, I threw one of them into a wall. Brilliant. Yeah. Put, that, put that on the on the whiteboard. Yeah. I pushed Throw, it. Hit with spades. I pushed it Throw into a canal wall. and I hoped that they were so <laughs> shocked that they would drown. Which is one of it, which is, ah. Uh... <laughs> Poor. And yeah, then, but then on. later on, a few pages later, it then says, it suddenly dawned on Harris why he'd become in the operation. It wasn't really that necessary. He'd hardly call his help invaluable. Foskins had been mistreated by the public. Mistreated and un- 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 unappreciated. They'd yelled for his blood, and his superiors had given it to him. On the surface, anyway. And he himself had scorned him. So Harris, in a symbolic way, represented the public. Yeah. He was Foskin's actual contact with the people who had derided him. And now he was going to prove them wrong yeah. through him. Yeah. Showing he was still in command and very, very able. Good luck! Thought yeah. Harris. I'm like, that's the most convoluted thing I've ever heard. Yeah, and at this and I've point, I've read Jack Derrida. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like. <laughs> and at this point, what? you know full well that Foskins is going to die at some point. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's, it, another yeah, character absolutely. which is just like, oh, I've sketched out this two lines of uh, you know background story. His wife, uh, but unfaithful, blah blah blah. blah but he wears a pinstripe suit, which he doesn't mention, but I'm sure he does. Oh, we've killed him now. Yeah. Uh, so where are we now? Harris takes an exterminator to the canal to show them where the, the rats were, rather than just saying, I saw them by the canal. The, the little man happens to look just like a rat. Yeah, the, the rat 
uh, Feature Man follows the rats to a. They watch them run along the canal. Yeah, to a, yeah, and they te- they are they go to attack a a tower block, and then some workmen come and help. Harris oh yes, kill the rats. Seventies. Yeah, worth. and an old lady comes out with an umbrella or something, doesn't? Yeah, she and she gets attacked, and they get killed. I've just realised we've missed something. The totally pointless MacGuffin of the fact that these rats are all carrying a disease. Yes. Which is absolutely pointless. If you get pointless. bitten by one, you would, you, you your, your skin gets really tight, rips, and then... Yeah, and, and you, you get, turn yellow. And you get jaundice. It's... Why is that in it? It's pointless. To make it, to make just it to more... Just to make it extra scary. Yeah. So just Ugh. kind of like, oh, even if you escape the rats, you still die. Yeah. Oh, and there's, and there's some see. good yeah. bits where people think, oh... I got away with that, but then everyone knows that that person's no, been bitten they and they're going to... they're done for. There's a short chapter where Harris just talks about the inequality and poverty in the East End. Rubbish. Like all art teachers. Yeah. yeah. And, and also, can I point out that, you know, once again, I know it's the 19th century left. and things were different, but it's hilarious. He's an art teacher. So he's a, he's a teacher in a secondary school and he's got a flat just by King's Cross. <laughs> <laughs> and he talks about looking out over the Georgian terraces. Oh, I like, know. On your wages, mate. Not that these days you wouldn't. I think this is like someone has read it and said, they're going to say you need a subtext. So people can pick up on this part and say the subtext is how badly poor people are treated in cities. But because of this whole structure of the book, everyone is punished yep. and no one yes. gets away with it. So it's like the subtext is is nonsense. Yeah. Um, and it, and it, looks, it makes the rats look like... The subtext is like, it's more like modernity, because all he does is moan about modernity mm-hmm. when he goes to Stratford yeah, on holiday. Well, that's the next chapter. They go to Stratford on uh, holiday. Okay. They go to Stratford, which I should probably point out that I, I class as a kind of hometown, so I know it pretty well, to be honest. I mean, Stratford is a lovely place. It's obviously known for Shakespeare. I moved there in 1985, so it's only 10 years after this book was published. I can tell you that in summer, it's it's full of tourists, but... The points that he's making about, like, he's got issues with, um, you know, it's been spoiled because of multicultural accents. Then they go and it's full of wimpy bars, which is bollocks. I think there was a McDonald's (laughs) at that point. Like, how many fast food restaurants were there in tiny market towns at that point in Britain? And then We don't even have one in Dorchester now. No. (laughs) And then they go in a pub and there's there's a busty wench kind of uh, waitress, which I know is absolute crap because that never happened in stratford and then they're they're sat at a table and like a piece of wood that's made to look like the place look oldie worldy he touches it and it's made of plastic and he's like come on we've got to get out of here we're gonna go up on a hill and have sex we're gonna go on this hill and then there's this weird thing where his girlfriend is like oh yeah it's fine you know you went to this place and there was loads of people there and it was just too busy for you and it's like no he's just a crabby twat for us now he is nostalgic and you think what is he nostalgic for in 1973 like you don't really know how old he is do you at that point is he in his 30s or something i'm not sure yeah around about so, that. well he said he'd worked in advertising first yeah, which that is what uh, james herbert did work in advertising he wrote this while yeah, he was yeah yeah, yeah, he was, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what i'm saying yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you just like what? What is his issue? Like, it's I find I found that part. He, and he's even grumpy having sex because um because, <laughs> because he, he can't can't get the right angle. And they there's a whole sort of description of them trying to rotate while still being inside each. Bloody oh, stupid! Blimey. It was horrible. No, no. It's we just, didn't need that. We didn't need that in lockdown. We've the, got enough on our plates. I think these bits show the book up really for what it is and it's a kind of patchwork of vignettes which he obviously enjoy, enjoyed writing more than the narrative so where he tries to stitch the narrative together he's like oh um right I don't know what's gonna happen now but they're gonna go on holiday they'll go to Stratford and then I can put this bit in this subtext of like modernity but again that all that makes the rats look like is modernity and his fear of modernity and that's what it said to me that he was just terrified of black people coming in and and modern life and pubes and yeah. pubes. <laughs> and pubes. Well, he likes pubes. He likes pubes. He's terrified he likes of. Pubes. Sorry, sorry. He's terrified of tramps, gays, women, <laughs> Catholics, <laughs> um, black people, women who want to have an um, orgasm, cinemas, yep. uh, tube station. It's just. Oh God. I should. I should also point out. You know, I'm going to have to. You know, address the elephant in the room at this point. If anyone's never seen Garth Marenghi's Dark Place, 
which is fantastic. You should seek out Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. If you live in the UK, it's available it. on... You should watch it, right? It's on uh, 4OD, and if you're not in the UK, it's quite cheaply available, I think, on DVD. I don't think there's ever been a Blu-ray release. Uh, but basically, it's, it's just kind of sending up James Herbert and the Ilk, the kind of like the mass market, pulpy, slasher horror theme. And as he says, you know, it's intersped. Like he is, Garth Marenghi is supposed to have written a series for the nascent Channel 4 in the 1980s, which they've then uncovered. And it's interspersed with interviews with him. And as he says, subtext is for cowards. <laughs> he says, and yeah, just as, yeah, as I was reading this, I was like, yeah, Garth Marenghi's Dark Place is incredibly on the nose. We go to Stratford, another just shoehorned in bit of filler, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, really? well, there's, there's a couple of sex scenes. And it's not a long book either, is it? I think it, it was like, this is, I've written it and it's still not long enough to be classed as a novel, so I need a bit of a bit where they go on holiday. <laughs> yeah, it's about the length of a Target novelisation of Doctor Who, isn't it? 197 pages. Yeah, I mean, that's not very long. After their pointless holiday, we come back and we have another vignette about a young lad who's getting the, a late tube home because, and, he, uh. and he's moaning about his girlfriend being a, a PT, which then they go on to explain means prick tees because she won't have sex with him. And then he gets attacked by and killed by some rats. A station master, who, which they go, he talks about him being coloured. And then there's a yeah. whole thing about how coloured, coloured. This is not my word, the words of James Herbert. Not yeah. being treated very well, working on the, on the underground. And then the rats chase him and he hides in a cupboard. No, you've mixed up two people there, Cleves. Have I? There's someone. There's a guy on the platform who is coloured in inverted commas, who is lower than the station manager. Oh, okay. Sorry. They both get killed. The station manager is a fat man who hides in a cupboard, and he, he is racist about the black tube worker. And it, but it, it's really mixed up because you it because he does this thing where he's writing from the point of view of the person in these weird vignettes. You go from action to vin to vignette and the thoughts mm. of the character, which makes the whole thread at this point just feel racist because it's like you jump from this guy then thinking about he calls the the black guy um uh that stupid ape and i was reading this going what and it took me a while to realize that that those are the thoughts of the character so not not the the um the book yeah the omniscient narrator it's it's so mm. problematic even though there was an attack at a tube station in the night yeah. The yeah. tube's still running the next morning. Of course it is. You wouldn't close the tube just because people have died. <laughs> and this is where we have a, a whole story, the attack on the tube, where an older chap rescues two younger women. And that's where we see, for some reason, a woman loses all of her clothes during the attack. In the best possible taste. It's very Cupid's stunt, isn't it? That's one for the scene. There's ages. a point where a hero on the tube gets pushed yeah. and his face is squashed into a woman's breast and lap. And uh, which makes him really embarrassed. So it's, it's again wish fulfillment on yeah. here as yeah, well. Like, yeah, 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 I yeah. want to be the person who rescues these two women, but at the same time yeah. <laughs> being forced, being forced to be in the heaving bosoms. Yeah. That was the best bit of these vignettes for me. This one worked the best for me. It was slightly creepy, and I thought that the the guy was quite interestingly written, and he wasn't a perv. Um, he saved the women, and then he went back into the tunnel. But because it's this book, we never hear from him again he's just lost to the mist of time which... for me this is my favorite part coming up is when we mm. have the attack on the school this is what, what james mm. james has highlighted reading it, from earlier was, yes reading from earlier i found the most ridiculous thing ever <laughs> which i picture as the school in remembrance of the daleks if anyone's well, <laughs> seen that it's a kind of victorian classic victorian school, London absolutely school. it's got a basement hasn't it's it? it's got a basement with, with the, uh, it's got those benches with with, with bunsen yep. burners on it's got all that stuff Big yeah. high Although window. there's a small boy, even though they're all teenagers, at one point he picks up a small boy, and I thought, what's he doing there? <laughs> he shouldn't be in that school. Oh well, yeah, he's so about he's seven. Does he say he's seven? Like, oh. He says he's seven. Maybe of he was course. just passing, and he yeah, just picks yeah, up a yeah. small boy. Oh, I like schools, but it's quite an exciting um, <laughs> action sequence. It does work quite well, and uh, but again, you have to picture the scene yourself because he doesn't describe any of what the location looks like. Mm. which for me is a real problem because you don't get a sense of this could be a brand new modern comprehensive school or it could be like i've said a victorian school victorian, so i just pictured yeah. it as my own senior school that's that was what, oh what I saw. <laughs> see well my own. grimble a beak-nosed sparrow of a man pushed forward really as deputy head i he began We've no time for internal politics now, Grimble! Harris snapped, 
making some of the younger teachers hide smiles of pleasure behind their hands. <laughs> well, they're being well known and dis- <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Grimble was well known and disliked for his conniving and petty ways. He turned away huffily. It's like, come on, mate. First of all, you don't, you know, in school, you don't do that. We've got no time for internal politics now. We're being attacked by rats. Who would say that? The name and then also Grimble the fact, like, the other well. teachers are like... <laughs> That's him told? It's like, you'd be like, oh my God, killer rats are trying to kill us. Yeah, exactly. You'd you know, be like, shitting yourself. No relation to reality. I, no rats and I just thought the name Grimble was just the stupidest, Grimble. most... Um, Dickensian. Yeah, well, yeah, it's like it's like a, an idiot's idea of a Dickensian name, isn't it? It's like, yeah. we've yeah. got to describe this man in this, with the stupidest name. So it's like calling him like Mr. Willie or something, isn't it? It's just... <laughs> John, you'll always be Mr. Willie to me from that now on. Mr. Willie, Mr. Willie ran forward. Oh, as deputy head, said Mr. Willie. Basically, they defeat them by the fire brigade turning up and squirting them with hoses and drowning them. Yeah. yeah. So then we have... Bla- closing doors. Yeah, closing doors yeah. and lock at the middle. They close doors. doors. On them. They, uh, the, the headmaster, yeah, I imagined him as one of those old men you don't see now. We have tweed jackets with like leather patches on the elbows. Absolutely. Yeah. So he's bitten. He's had his side he's done. like bored away, hasn't he? He's so he's got the disease. Well, then we have Black Monday, where there's attacks all over the east end of London. I'm going to keep calling him Foreskins. Foreskins is asked <laughs> to join a, a task force to come up with a way to solve the rat problem. As previously yeah. mentioned, bring him back insane. in. Insane, insane. Yeah. This is where they find out that there seems to be a mutant gi- giant strain. black rat strain, yeah. which has evolved from something yeah. which might have been illegally brought into the country. Yeah. Immigration Immigrants. subtext. See, yeah. prefiguring UKIP. Yeah. Yeah. They discuss that Good. they may be oh. used. So this is this just comes in here. They discuss that the, the rats may be using high frequency sounds to communicate. Yeah. Just because one of them looked up and Why turned not? its head at one point. Yeah. As if listening to There's something. There's also a weird point when we're told that a young boy just walked through a lot of the rats. Yeah. They just left yeah. him alone for some reason. They just looked at it him. It was a mystery. Yeah. yeah. But they didn't have the, the signal to kill from their, from this thing, which is going to be introduced in the last oh. two pages. Dun, dun, dun. Exactly. <laughs> With no basis. But something we have to say at this point is that um, Harris is having this thing where he's like, ooh, there's something on the tip of my tongue that I can't remember that I've witnessed somewhere or someone's told me and I don't know what it is and I don't know what it is. And it's like, why is this in the story? It just doesn't make sense. So basically he read the, he's read the prologue and he, he, <laughs> and he doesn't know what, what that's got to do with the story, but he keeps remembering the prologue. That's what it is. <laughs> so they agree to introduce a special virus to kill the rats and they want to introduce this to the rats by feeding them infected puppies <laughs> that's right listeners feeding them infected puppies and the only person they could, who could possibly show them where to put the infected puppies is harris so he is there yeah naturally from the teacher. area yeah yeah sorry I, I must interject again at this point this is already the second time that that this foskins has cocked up this um situation so the first yeah. time he's got in trouble because they brought in rat kill and um the guy has been eaten that works for rat kill and then he's been fired then they've brought him back to oversee this elite group of specialists art teacher specialists <laughs> so he's supervising this elite group in the ministry of defense in unit yeah but he but he's been fired but brought back in secret and then later in the story we find out that happens again so this guy has three goes at this and fails every time, basically, doesn't he? It's, it's, it's probably it's something idiotic. got something to do with it. His uh, his absolutely disastrous marriage, which we hear all about, <laughs> and how his wife's been yeah. having sex with other men, which is oh, fine God. until she starts telling people about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Harris shows Terrible. some sites around the East End where the rats could be hiding to deploy the yeah. dogs, um, and at one location they're attacked by lots lots of rats and they again narrowly escape. Uh, but this yeah. is where they introduce these like, anti-rat suits. Yeah. Yes. Which is quite cool. I, like, I quite like that. It's plast- a p- kind of plasticky material with visors and heavy gloves, aren't they? Yeah. Um, I can see that quite well in my head, like what that looks like. Like that part works quite well. The virus seems to work and the rats are start coming out to the streets to die and everyone celebrates. Yeah. Story's over. Yeah. Although yeah. this is only no. chapter 13. Yeah. Unlucky for some. So this is where we have the half uh, sex scene, which James re- read us a nice. All oh, right, okay, cool. And then the sex in the bath is interrupted by a rat attack in the north Mega of rats. London. No, isn't it? 
is it? I don't. They go to a party to celebrate, and then there's a yes. phone call. They've got, the rats have gone bonkers. They're back. Okay. Yeah, right. But we <laughs> then get two of the aforementioned vi- vignettes. One of them is an attack in a cinema. Yeah, and it features even a bit that I put. Oh, it's just so ridiculous. I'm going to have to read that out. <laughs> even. Even I, as someone who is an actual secondary school teacher, if one of my students, I don't teach English, but if someone who was 15 handed this into me, I'd just go to him, you can, you can do better than that. You could, that. That's dreadful. That's so heavy handed. It's unbelievable. And then we also get the vignette of the, of the uh, zookeeper. Oh, I love that bit. Yeah. Oh, I, that made me laugh. I just that, love that. I, that, I that just, was actually funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so first of all, the rats attack the cinema and there's a desperate kind of fight for survival, which fails and everyone in the cinema is, is killed. It's prelude to it a, says, a boob um, feel. Though there's a whole thing about him putting a hand inside someone's bra and having a, a grape yeah, yep, before, right. before this all happens. And then when it says, uh, the vermin were on him in an instant, smothering his body with their own foul-smelling forms, biting into him, <laughs> pushing each other aside to get his flesh. His arms beat at them, growing weaker and weaker at every effort, until he finally lay across his face, put them across his face for protection, allowing the creatures to gorge themselves on uh, his body. Uh, Raising one arm from his eyes, uh, he stared up uncomprehendingly at bit. the huge coloured screen above him. His eyes read the words, <laughs> and his voice spoke them faintly, but his brain did not understand. He whispered, The end. And he's like, What? <laughs> That's his. He whispered them, but, and again, and this is just flashing back to our whole uh, Frankenstein episodes. That's not how the brain works, mate. If you've said the words, part of your conscious mind is aware of what you've said. If you and you're also not end, going to be saying that while rats while are eating your stomach and intestines. Absolutely. You're going to just be screaming. <laughs> fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> mommy, 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 mommy. <laughs> yeah so then we have the attack on london zoo which is ripped off from um curse of the cat people whichever the cat first cat people film is and quatermass experiment oh. more quatermass experiment because there's a bit where the the creature breaks into london zoo i think he's ripped a lot of this off films actually a zookeeper oh. tries to save the animals by setting them all free and then yeah. is hilariously killed by a cheetah who... <laughs> which is in many ways, it prefigured and ahead of you know the recent Netflix hit documentary Tiger King, yeah, yeah. in which yeah. we find out that you know even though that you might breed them from when they were tiny, tiny they will cubs, turn. they will turn and they will kill yeah. you. Yeah. Well. I do want to see a, a giraffe being taken down by some giant rats. I think that that's something which <laughs> needs to be captured on screen at some point. And a gorilla as well. I just thought, you know, rats, uh, giant rats, however big they are, can't kill something like a gorilla. It would literally just smash them to smithereens. Stupid, stupid, stupid. And then suddenly there's a massive leap of logic going forwards here. So where London is then evacuated. Evacuated. And it's just like. Yeah. Everyone everyone out out of London. There you go. Uh, we're going to no set problem. up some ultrasonic sound beams. To, Six million people. Yeah, to, to <laughs> leave the rats out into the open so we can gas yeah. them. It's like, yeah. hang on. Oh, this is the point where when I read this, I thought, have I missed a couple of chapters? Yeah, no. have you missed no, no, exposition? No, 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 no. And then Forskins comes up and says, I've done some research and I found out there was a zoologist yeah. who was important. No, this is the last few chapters of the book, this comes up. Yeah. A, a zoologist has been importing rats from an island which was near a nuclear test site. Yeah. And then he's been experimented on them and crossbreeded them. <laughs> yeah. And where it turns he, out... Where does he live? In the house from the prologue. <laughs> he says, I need to go... For no reason, I need to go there now. Yeah. Why? We're gonna, we've got a plan now. We're just going to... Um, Get them all out yeah. in the open and, and, and gas them. No, yeah. I'm going to go. I'm going to go to this house. So he went to it, and then Harris goes, I need to go and rescue him. Doesn't yeah. tell any, send a policeman or a no. soldier or something or like that. Or army. No, or anyone. He decides. It's just, yeah, all of this bit is where it really falls to pieces, isn't it? Yeah, but then he has to drive through all the rats at slow speed, wheels spinning over the crunching bodies and stuff. And that's where we come across the super giant big rats who... Um, head butts his way through the windscreen of a car which is isn't that glass glass pretty strong on the yeah. windscreen of a car i don't think a I rat could, so. yeah could head butt his no, way no through. bigger than a yorkshire terrier yeah, yeah. <laughs> head butts his way through i think it says he's got a hillman minx so it's quite an old-fashioned <laughs> car but it's still i th- you could probably drive through cows and probably 
get the cows out of the way, let alone rats. He points out that maybe the Pied Piper, the story of the Pied Piper <laughs> may have been something where this has happened in the past before. Yes. That's a stretch, isn't it? This is where it steps into sci-fi, and I think he re- just loses... He just lo- loses grasp of what he's created, doesn't he, really? A bit like the man who has bred these rats, actually. So they go into the house. He finds the yeah. body of Foreskins in the basement. With a, with a handy axe with in a his handy hand. Axe. And then he has to fight two giant super... Giant, giant rats. Giant, giant rats who are... Giant rats. Who are guarding yeah. something which he, he, he glimpses in the corner but doesn't, doesn't look at. Until... It's white or grey, isn't it? Yeah, something white or grey in the corner. He manages to <laughs> kill kill the super 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 big rats whilst yeah. losing some of his fingers, uh, but and then an ear. and an ear. But he points out that he he's been inoculated against the poisonous bites, which yeah, oh, again, how convenient. Which I, I again he points I points out to himself. Yeah, and I was thinking, did that happen in the book? I can't. I didn't realize no. there was a nook. They came up with a vaccine. No. Well, they they mention a vaccine. Well, they mention that that the rats have they fed the puppies to the rats. The rats have died. And the rats have come back because they've developed this immunity within weeks. But then, in the meantime, humans have already developed a vaccination for the rat's disease, which, you know, in like two weeks or something. Like, as we know... Very much along, it's sort of... (laughs) It takes a while. It takes a year, minimum, which... uh, So I... Yeah, this is... This is the point where, for me, your suspension of disbelief just becomes... Stretched. It's been stretched, yeah. You know, kind of wafer thin as it is. Shoe pastry. How, however, I would say I was enjoying the book at this point. I had to keep oh. stopping and going back, thinking, "Have I missed some chapters?" Because <laughs> it wasn't making any sense. But it, it was dragging me through. I was like, "I, I need to." <laughs> I was enjoying it. I think it was quite exciting at this point. Wow. Uh, I thought it was nonsensical. Oh. It's like I, I was just like, "Please let this end. Uh, Please let." We're gonna, we've, we've just decided we're going to evacuate 7 million people. We're going to do that in over a weekend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we're going to set up technology t- that can cover the whole area of London with this sonic sound, but they don't mention anything about that at all. No. We've got this gas that we're going to put everywhere, but luckily it doesn't harm humans. Mm-hmm. But they don't. They say they got that off off the Nazis. Off the Nazis. Yes. I think that was the disease, wasn't it? Was that the disease or the gas? I'm I mean, not sure. Can you believe while you're reading something like that that they've managed to develop a gas that will hurt rats and not humans? No, you can't really. And it's just like, oh, um, or oh, make sure you just don't breathe too much of the gas, or you might pass out. And it's like, well, if it can poison a mammal, it can poison a human, can't mm, it? Yeah. Like if you eat rat poison, you're going to feel quite unwell. Mm, mm. So get a carry on to the end, the denouement, yeah. the love of for everyone's benefit. Right? The love of God. <laughs> At this point, he, he pulls the um the torch out of the dead hand of foreskins to yeah. see what the white shape he saw in the corner was, oh. and yeah. it's a giant two headed. Mutant rats. It's all, it's almost like a human head, isn't it? This is what I question at this point. Has it been crossbred with a human in some way? I don't is know. That what, is that the implication? I, I think I, you're getting mixed up with first one. <laughs> I was thinking Alien 4, I think, actually. Ah. This is where this comes out of nowhere. It's literally in the last three or four pages of the book. Oh, by the way, and that's what's been commanding them all. Yes. Yeah. It's like the commander rat. Yeah, it's ki- they call yeah. it a rat king. Well, yes. they call it the rat king. Where king. is it? I, I, must actually be a rat queen if it's giving birth to the rats, but mm. but don't think about that. Just hack it to pieces with a fire axe and walk out. The end. That's the end of the book. <laughs> and he looks at his stumpy fingers. That's the end, or so we think. So we think. Oh, it's a post-credit sequence. So we've got to the end, which the post-credit sequence really enraged me. Oh, it excited me. I just wanted to throw the book out the window at this point. <laughs> so, in the post credit sequence, one pregnant rat survives the gassing of London. It's locked in a basement with a load of food, which uh, some uh, shopkeeper has stored away to try and make some money after, after the great ooh, big event. Ooh. The rat gives birth, and what are those babies? It's another two-headed white mutant uh. king rat. <gasps> da, da, da. Yeah. Gasp! The horror is not over. This happens Please. to be... So after all the travails of main character to get this sorted, he's had his ear bitten off, he's had his fingers bitten off, he's gone, he's killed the main baddie. Just end the book there. 
But really, what you do then is bring in this really lame epilogue, hoping that you can do a, then do a sequel. Yeah. Uh, oh, it just really annoyed me because it just oh. made, it, 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 it literally makes everything in the book pointless because it's like, you think the story's over, but actually it's not over, which I always hate endings like that, unless it's like Halloween or something. It's just, I think it's lazier than writing a really good ending. Oh, mm. well, personally, I enjoyed that and it made me excited to read Lair. Which is the? <laughs> have you have have you read the sequels, Ross? Yes, I. Have. I know I've read Domain, but I can't. I've got no memory yeah. whatsoever of them. So, by by the third one, has the Rat King got like the face of a small boy or something like that? I know that the um... the, the, the the fourth one is in a, <laughs> some po- fourth. There's the rats, lair, domain, and the city, which is a graphic novel, which is where the rats take graphic over novel. take over the the world, and it's some kind of like rat apocalypse. Wasteland. Only an art teacher can save the yeah. humanity. I'm not sure if Harris is a, a, a recurring character. No, he isn't. As far as I remember, Lair is a guy whose family were killed by rats in the rats, and he wants revenge on the rats, and that's set in a forest somewhere, so it's like a, a, a countryside setting. Then Domain is set back in London again, and that's post-apocalyptic, post-nuclear holocaust thing, which is really boring, and it's mainly set in a bunker, which floods and people have got diseases and radiation poisoning it's really really depressing and the graphic novel i didn't know about until yesterday i don't think mm-hmm. so which it goes for quite a lot I, of money. I, yeah i can imagine actually if it's only on a small print run but i won't be reading the other two uh, i'd rather die at the moment i think i might secretly do it and not tell anyone <laughs> Okay, yeah. but like, you do that, mate. What do you, what do you get up to in the privacy of your own home? <laughs> no, so, you can read whatever you like, Cleve. So, would we recommend the rats? No, <laughs> absolutely not. As some kind of academic thing to look at how race and gender and all kinds of politics are dealt with in pulp fiction of the 1970s yes if i'm suggesting it to someone to read for fun i would say absolutely not no yeah i think <laughs> <laughs> a really pregnant pause then for you please for, for me i'm aware of all the things which are wrong with it and uh and, <laughs> oh no and, here we go and how i love it oh i just <laughs> i enjoyed it i i found it i thought it was charming I it, no i found it fun to read I don't know if I'd recommend it to anyone because they might may think that that's the kind of stuff I get off on, um, which I, <laughs> I secretly do. I found it more enjoyable and horrific than the stuff yeah. which we've covered so far. So for me, mm, okay. this has been my the, my favourite thing we've covered so far. Uh, are you on drugs? <laughs> <laughs> that is the most outrageous thing i've ever heard you say please but if we all agreed it'd be a rubbish podcast wouldn't it oh my god that is demented (laughs) on that bombshell oh oh my god it's got a scene where a man has a revelation sat on the toilet (laughs) that's where i have all my revelations his epiphany is reading graffiti <laughs> Raising one arm from round his eyes, he whispered the, the words. His voice spoke them, but his brain did not understand. The end. Come on, Ross. I'm not saying it's well written. I, I'm not saying it's a well written book. I'm just saying okay, I enjoyed okay, it. It's good. It's good. I think good. there are pulp stories you can enjoy, and I think there's just badly written, shoddy rubbish. And I think this is really badly written, shoddy rubbish. And I, I just, I cannot, I honestly can't believe that this went to print without anyone, a chain of command, looking at this and going, guys, we can't print this. This is this is doggerel. This, it's this rubbish. Guy, the, the, the author of this book was one of the most famous British authors uh, of oh, his yeah. age uh, he was on tell he was on chat shows it tells you a lot about the mental acuity of the people reading this rubbish and also that yes there was less entertainment around in the <laughs> 1970s that's <laughs> what i thought three-day week and all he was that. the british stephen king but it is oh. really interesting that he's for- completely forgotten now no one talks already about- yeah, yeah no yeah, one yeah, talks yeah, about yeah, james yeah, herbert yeah, at all yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I think that's interesting. Of his time, as you yeah, say. Yeah, I think that, you know, you see Stephen King being quite kind of... Um, 
And he's problematic as well, if you look at some of his early stuff. Yeah, but he, he's very outspoken on Twitter, and, he's, and he comes across as a good guy, and I'm doing inverted commas again. He, you know, he's anti-Trump, and he seems quite sane. Whereas James Herbert, reading this, like, the subtext for me is, like, like I hadn't made that thing that you have both just pointed out, out about the, you know, the rats basically being illegal immigrants. And I think the whole subtext of the story is really problematic. It's it's one man having a nightmare about modern life coming to uh, engulf him. John, remind me, what does it say on your Twitter handle? Modern life is rubbish. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, I agree, but I, I don't write shoddy, racist, sexist, anti-Catholic novels. <laughs> oh, you're making me sound sound bad. I don't agree with any of the any of his points of view. I just enjoyed reading the, event, <laughs> the adventure. I just enjoy reading about points of view. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what would you give it out of five, good chaps? I think I said this, that we needed to develop a minus yeah, system. You can have a minus score yes. if you want to. I, I think, my, I think the, the worst would be minus ten. So I would say minus 10. Minus 10 from John. James. Minus 2. Minus 2 from James. Okay. Minus, only minus 2. Mm. Yeah. So you know, Jimmy, like minus is like, oh. Is it, is so, you it... know, I felt like, look, we're all in our <laughs> 40s now. And I'm under no illusions. I've got fewer summers ahead of me than, I, than I've got, got behind me now. And sometimes <laughs> you're reading things. It's like I can feel, you know, the clock. Ticking yeah. loudly, oh. and it's like I've got better things to be doing than reading this. <laughs> but that's it. Wasn't like oh my, oh, I want to pull my eyes out. It's so yeah. bad because there was some hilarity there for me. Yeah. So I got hilarity out of it, and of, of yeah. course enjoyed talking to you two about it. But I wouldn't ever want to pick it up again. Yeah. So on the scoreometer, is 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 zero average, as in fine? No, I, I would say. Um... Zero, zero is bad. Yeah, zero is bad. So do you think so? Three is good. Yeah, three is good. Right. Three's okay, good. that's three, fine. Three okay. Good. So you you were both like two. Did you both say two two ish for Dracula AD nineteen seventy two? Didn't you? And uh, one yeah. for Curse of Frankenstein. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm thirteen points below where I was for. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna give this. I'm gonna give this a three and a half. <laughs> wow. There we go. <laughs> What's that sound? Oh, it's the it's the the man, the men in the white coats, and the coming in the van to take Cleaver away yeah. to read his book in his cell. That was the rats. <laughs> and trust me, we will talk about something that I enjoy. I, I'm very much <laughs> aware that everything we talked about, I'm like, no. But we, the next book or the next the short stories that we are going to be talking about, somewhere I absolutely love. So you will hear me being positive. Yes. And, and these are written by the guy that invented that Hoover, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll come to that later. Next, we've got something horrific. I'm bringing to the table another book another old book which i picked up from a charity shop called this is called uh lacey linda's <laughs> love stories <laughs> um, <laughs> it's weird because there are no stories just photos uh and lots of them aren't in focus i know they're problematic but i enjoy them <laughs> no, problematic. it's a book called um dark harvest by a woman called Anne pilling it's it's, it's a children's book but it's, it is one of the most disturbing books i've read for quite a long time including the rats i would say it's probably scarier to me than the rats it wouldn't be hard and it's it's a classic story of a family who go on holiday to a uh, remote sort of location away from the city weird things start happening to them and it's mm. a case of their cousins then and the cousins obsessed with digging a hole in the back garden and he starts like finding bones they they start having like nightmares about like this emancipated it's emaciated, sorry, emaciated, 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 sorry, emaciated woman crawling across the field, eating. Not an emancipated woman. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> an emaciated suffragette. Exactly. An emaciated. Oh, I can't say it. A starving woman <laughs> dragging herself acro across a, 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 a muddy field. This is all set in Ireland and looking yeah. through the window. Uh, a, a, a boy gets obsessed that he's seen some weevils on someone's um, allotment and he sets fire Ooh. to it and then 
ends up almost killing the boy, the man's dog and all this kind of stuff. So it just it just gets more and more intense with all these visions and things which are weirdly happening. And um, and it's just and this sounds a bit like a memoir of your childhood. Oh, yeah. It's just <laughs> it's just really good. And I found out that it's the first part of a, a dark trilogy this woman's written, which I'm gonna have to, I have to get get oh. my hands on. But I I recommend Dark Harvest if you want to have something which is probably written for eleven year olds, which is gonna really shit you up. It's just the main thing that I've been reading is uh, Tashin uh, brought out the uh, the smaller version of the big kind of like the Star Wars book. It was originally like it was 120, 130 quid and it's described as the definitive kind of Star Wars book making of. And, and it's just, oh, it's beautiful. It's a, it's a thing of absolutely, it's a massive Star Wars fan myself. Um, it's just it's just terrific, full of really amazing, amazing archive pictures and interviews with George Lucas talking about the entire process. Fantastic. Like for example, today I'm reading it and I found out that uh, two directors that were in the frame for um uh empire strikes back were um alan parker of, of bugsy malone fame which i can kind and, of see yeah and john badham who directed saturday night fever they were both approached to be the directors of uh empire I strikes can't back see badham but i think alan parker no. would have been quite good Interesting, yeah, but you know, so yeah. things like that. Even I, and I would consider myself a diehard fan. Um, mm. I'm wearing a Star Wars T-shirt right now. Um, mm. As somebody who's a very, very committed fan, there's tons of stuff that I didn't know. And bearing mm. in mind, the book was in its original format, uh, like 120 pounds. It's now 20. Mm. No way. So, a a smaller format, yeah, but absolute bargain. Fantastic. So that's mm. what I've been enjoying this week. My horrible recommendation. I haven't watched it yet, but I have bought on DVD the Stone Tape. Oh, I got that. Oh. I got it. I got it. Which is which I've seen before, and I had it on VHS, but I've rebought it now to watch it again because uh, I haven't seen it for probably twenty years. So I'm very excited to see that again. Um, it's sci-fi horror. It's Nigel Neal, so that's two of my big. Well, if you want, we could do that for the podcast if you want. Yeah, Yeah, I'd love to do that. Uh, I I remember seeing it before and thinking it was a remarkable piece of television, like all of Nigel Neal's stuff, actually. It's like, I don't know how he managed to come up with so many original ideas. Just write them really well, actually. Compared to James Herbert, he... um, Nigel Neal deserved to um, sell 53 million books. Our next episode is meant to be The Medusa Touch. But do you want to skip? Oh. Do you want to skip that and go do the stone? Oh, tape? controversial! We could do, yeah. James, would you be up for that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Whatever you guys want to do. All right. So, next episode yeah. was going to be the Medusa touch, but we would do yeah. that. We we bump that onto the the following episode, and we yeah. will do the stone tape. We'll toss the script away. Yeah, that's what we do. We're on the okay. edge. Okay. So I don't. I haven't done any research to say where you can get the stone tape. I've got it on DVD because um, I think you got it for me, James, didn't you? Uh, I think I believe it, it is. Yeah. It's a double bill with Ghost Watch. Oh, is it? That's yeah. good. That's a great double bill. Yeah. So I bought it the other day off eBay for six quid. Check us out on Twitter, um, which is General Witch One, and, and I will uh, let you know where you can get access to the stone tape. Mm. on there if you could please subscribe to us uh please 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 we've got a, an Go austrian on. listener now as well as a belgian <laughs> listener so uh, uh, i i Yay! think you should do these updates every episode cleaves to see what say where uh, are, the, are the belgians still tuning the, the in Belgi- yeah the belgians downloaded the second episode as well oh, oh, they need to reach out across us, the... don't they Come yeah on, let us know, let us know on who Twitter. you are tweet us say hello, say hello. Please subscribe, get other people to subscribe, spread the word, and please support us on Patreon. Absolutely. If, if you really want us to do more of these, if people start giving us a little bit of money to do it, we're definitely going to yeah. do more. So that would be great. Um, and you could buy a Cushing Cushion at that buy point. Buy some Cushing Cushions. I've started putting um, some exclusive content up on the uh, Patreon site, which is basically stuff which I've got on my hard drive. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Careful. Yeah. <laughs> Linda's Lacey Love Stories again. Exactly. <laughs> volume two so yeah. uh, thank you very much and um, we'll speak to you soon thank you for listening everyone we'll see you next time love light and peace you have been listening to the general witch finders <laughs>
bit sad wow. that we didn't mention that book in the context of the the rampant paedophilia of the 1970s, especially with Jimmy Savile <laughs> and Gary Glitter. <laughs> I imagine then there may be another 70s artefacts that will have the opportunity to look at it through that prism. As well. A bald, fat, evil pervert in paradise. <laughs>